Hello, everyone. Who was the perpetrator of the most horrible crimes? Was it the mentally ill who had no control over themselves? Or cold-blooded sadist who calculated every move and enjoyed the process? While both deserve punishment, in today's society, everyone has the right to an attorney and a fair trial. After all, sometimes victims want retribution so badly that they'll turn into killers themselves. A group of men armed with rifles and pitchforks are walking through a wheat field. One of them finds a scrap of a child's clothing. The villagers rush forward with redoubled vigor in the hope of rescuing the children. The old man wakes up. Although Paul Edgecombe lives in a nursing home, the man is cheerful and self-sufficient. After washing up, he asks for only two pieces of fried bread for breakfast. The nurse guesses that Paul is planning to sneak out for a walk in the mountains, although this is not allowed. He's willing to turn a blind eye to this and asks the man to be careful. Paul leaves and arrives at an abandoned cabin in the woods. Upon his return, everyone is watching an old movie called Top Hat on TV. Paul becomes anxious and begins to cry. His friend Elaine comforts the man. The old pair discuss how abruptly heavy memories can come flooding back. 60 years ago, Paul worked in a prison during the Great Depression. Back then, people couldn't find work, and the man really held on to his position. He was a lead guard on the death row block, the last mile. It was also nicknamed the Green Mile, due to the color of its floor tiles. We had the electric chair. Oh, Sparky, we called it. <laughs> the most notable year for him was 1935. That's when Paul contracted bladder infection. His colleagues Brutus and Dean advise him to take a day off and go to the doctor, but the man refuses. Today, he's supposed to meet a new prisoner. Soon, a vehicle stops in front of the entrance. Rookie Percy and experienced Harry escort out the huge man seated inside. Even the six foot four tall Brutus seems like a little boy next to him. To say nothing of the brash and small Percy, who annoys the other guards with his behavior, Paul meets the barefooted giant and asks him if he's going to cause any trouble. The man of his size could have easily scattered the guards but instead his face shows traces of nervousness and even fear. The criminal obediently calls Paul boss and walks into his cell. The officer orders Percy out. The guy resists and gets yelled at. The humiliating scene is noticed by an inmate named Dell, who giggles in the guard's face and gets his finger broken with a baton strike. When Percy finally leaves, Paul asks to uncuff John. He's clearly mentally challenged. The only thing that Coffee knows how to spell is his own name. What's up, boss? like to drink, only not spelled the same. The man asks shyly if they turn off the lights after bedtime. Who would have thought the giant is afraid of the dark? Luckily for him, the lights in the corridor are on all night. He extends his hand to Paul in gratitude. The guards tense up because John could crush the boss, but Paul sees that there is nothing to fear. In the end, Coffee says a weird phrase about how he wanted to make things right, but it was too late. The protagonist asks for the new prisoner's file, Harry says that his crime makes his blood curdle. In a small village, two sisters were kidnapped right from their home. The father and the rest of the villagers rushed in pursuit. They found John Coffey holding the girl's mangled bodies in his hands. The man himself was screaming and crying for some reason, apparently realizing what he had done. I couldn't help it. I tried to take it back, but it was too late. The father almost killed Coffey, but they pulled him away. The damage report on the girl's body leaves Paul in shock. That's when Warden Hall Moores comes up to him. Paul asks the old friend about his wife. Melinda is suffering from terrible headaches. As for their work, they soon need to organize the execution of yet another inmate by the name of Bitter Buck. Also, Paul needs to be more careful with Percy. He's related to the governor, and he cannot be simply dismissed. However, the nasty fellow already has his eyes set on a different position at a mental asylum. He clearly has an unhealthy interest in psychopaths. Paul realizes that Percy could have transferred a long time ago but he's waiting for something. Apparently, he wants to see an execution in person. If the guy leaves after that without a scandal, then all of them are ready to give him a farewell show. At home, Paul suffers from insomnia. He doesn't understand how God allowed John Coffey's terrible crime to happen. His wife wants to help him fall asleep and invites him to bed. Paul refuses, mentioning his infection. The next day, a mouse is spotted in the prison cell block. It fearlessly walks out into the middle of the corridor and doesn't try to flee from people. Brutus feeds it, and the rodent escapes to a soft-walled cell for violent prisoners. It's used as a storage room and packed to the ceiling. The guards search throughout the place, but the mouse is gone. Later, it returns nonchalantly, and Percy notices it. He becomes furious and tries to crush the creature. The mouse goes back into the cell. Hearing the screams, the others run over and try to calm the madman. They decide not to stop his attempts to find the mouse to mock him a bit. Percy spends plenty of time carrying things around, once again to no avail. 
The rookie is then scolded for making a lot of noise. We don't scare them any more than we have to, Percy. They are under enough strain as it is. Paul explains that the guard's job is to maintain a calm environment because their prisoners are mentally unstable. Under stress, they can snap and cause harm to themselves and others. In response, Percy only insults the prisoners and his colleagues. Brutus grabs him by the throat, but Paul stops his friend. Percy can use his connections to fire them, but the supervisor is fed up with his antics. Edgecombe assures him they're ready to lose their jobs. If Percy goes too far again, he'll get a beating regardless. Soon, Bitterbuck leaves for a farewell date with his wife and daughter, and the guards rehearse the execution. The role of the prisoner is played by an elderly janitor. As he is secured to the electric chair, the man makes vulgar jokes. The guards can't contain their laughter. Only dark humor helps them to keep their sanity. As the boss, Paul reprimands his subordinates. There should be no smiling at the real execution. Percy is also watching from the sidelines with great interest. Before putting the cap with the electrodes on the prisoner, they must put a wet sponge on his head. This way, the death will come quicker and more humanely. In the evening, Bitterbuck's head is shaved for better conduction. Paul sits down to talk to the prisoner for the final time. The man believes that if one is truly repentant for his actions, he will go back in time to the happiest moment of one's life after death. For Bitterbuck, it was a trip to the mountains with his wife. In the evening, the flames of the campfire lit up her beautiful body. They were only 18, and they chatted until dawn. Paul says he believes it too. Maybe that's what heaven is like. Bitterbuck is still terribly afraid of the execution, and the guard calms him down as best he can. The man is strapped to the chair in the presence of witnesses in the hall. The electricity shall now be passed through your body until you are dead. In accordance with state law, God have mercy on your soul. Brutus orders to lower the switch. Terrible screams of pain fill the room. The doctor examines the body, but Bitterbuck's heart is still beating. The second surge takes place in complete silence. After the execution, Percy once again displays his ignorance. Adios, chief. Drop us a card from hell. Let's know if it's hot enough. Brutus pushes the scoundrel aside and takes the body away. Paul then talks to Percy about his transfer away from the Green Mile. The guy makes a condition. He wishes not just to observe, but to lead the next execution. Paul reluctantly agrees. The next day, the mouse comes out of hiding again. This time, it climbs up to Dell and he puts it on his shoulder. The man is crazy about the pet, whom he calls Mr. Jingles. The clever rodent even responds to the man's commands and brings him a spool of thread. Even Percy seems to have taken a liking to it and offers to allocate a cigar box as a home for the mouse. Then Hal informs Paul of the arrival of a new prisoner. William Wharton, nicknamed Wild Bill, has a lengthy criminal record. He will be executed for the murder of three people, including a pregnant woman. The warden suddenly becomes emotional and cannot contain his grief. His wife has been diagnosed with a large brain tumor. Hal doesn't know how to tell Melinda that she won't survive. At night, Paul is again suffering from groin pain. He'll see a doctor, but first he must admit Wharton. In the morning, Dean, Harry, and Percy take the prisoner out of the mental hospital. Because of the effects of the drugs, he seems to be no better than a vegetable. When he is brought to the mile, Paul is already burning from a fever because of his illness. Coffee asks the boss to come over, but the man is too busy. As soon as Wharton enters the building, he reveals his bluff. After hitting Percy, he puts chains around Dean's neck. Paul tries to help, but receives a blow between the legs and falls over from the pain. The elderly Harry can't handle the young madman either. Cowardly Percy freezes in a stupor. The situation is saved by Brutus, who knocks Wharton out. Yeah, big fucker. Where'd you come from? Paul sends his battered colleagues to the doctor and the rest to file a report. He himself stays behind to oversee the mile, though he can't stand upright because of the pain. Coffee asks him to come over again. It's not a good time, John Coffee. Not a good time at all. Gathering the last bit of his strength, the warden steps closer. With a sudden movement, John presses him against the bars. Dell calls for help, but Coffee grabs Paul between his legs. The light bulb in the cell lights up brightly and bursts. The giant lets go of the man and starts coughing violently. A strange cloud of ash shoots upward from his mouth and disappears into thin air. I just took it back, so awful tired, I boss. The whole time. John falls on the bed and falls asleep. Paul goes to the bathroom and feels that the pain has disappeared without a trace. It's as if he has been reborn. All evening and all night, he and his wife reminisce about their youth without leaving the bed. In the morning, Paul takes a day off. He tries to find out more about John Coffey from the lawyer who defended him in court. 
but the giant's past is a mystery. It's as if he simply appeared out of the blue. Edgecombe doesn't believe that Coffee is capable of cruelty, but the lawyer doesn't doubt his guilt. He compares John to a mutt his family had adopted. The dog was calm and kind, until it pounced on his son for no reason. The boy lost an eye. The next day, Paul gives John some cornbread that his wife baked. She'll miss us, please. Several times. Coffee shares the cornbread with Dell and Mr. Jingles. Wharton also asks for a piece, but gets ignored. The racist insults John, so Paul walks over to calm the scoundrel down. For this, the boss receives a spit in the face. This is a common behavior for Wild Bill, who annoys other guards as well. The criminal is pacified with water from a fire hose and thrown into solitary confinement. He promises not to cause any more inconvenience, but instead buys a pastry from the janitor and spits it in Brutus's face. He's thrown back into the solitary ward. Dell's execution is drawing near, but the man has no family. Instead, the prison staff play the roles of big shots who are interested in the circus mouse and want to see a performance. Meanwhile, Paul checks on Percy at the run-through of the execution ceremony. Everything goes smoothly. The guy sees Dell, who happily returns to the camera. The two seem ready to reconcile. When Percy abruptly startles the man, Dell falls and hits his head. Percy laughs and says it was just a joke. He gets distracted, and Wharton grabs him through the bars. The criminal gropes and threatens the guy, but quickly lets him go. I was just playing, I let him go. I've never heard a hire on his pretty little head. Wharton compares Percy to a little girl, and Dell rejoices at what he sees. Percy has pissed himself in fear, burning with shame. He demands everyone keep the humiliation a secret. Paul replies, what happens on the mile stays on the mile. Only Dell continues to taunt him. The day of the execution comes, and Dell is worried about Mr. Jingle's fate. Paul says he will look after him, but Dell replies that it would be scary for a mouse to live in a house next to a big forest. That's when Brutus invents a place called Mouseville, a giant tent with a whole mouse town organized inside. People visit it as if it were a circus. Dell believes in its existence and is very excited about it. It's the best possible place for Mr. Jingles. Suddenly the spool falls and the mouse runs out into the hallway after it. To the horror of those gathered, Percy squashes the rodent with his shoe and walks away. Dell screams in grief and Coffee extends his hand, saying they should hurry. Paul brings him the rodent's body and the giant puts his lips on the mouse. Light illuminates everything around them and revived Mr. Jingles runs back to Dell. Coffee lets out a cloud of ash from his mouth again. The guards can't believe their eyes. Paul and Brutus approach Percy. Just fine. You know better mouse killing than you are at anything else around here. The scoundrel is shocked that the mouse is still alive. He yells at his colleagues, thinking that they have decided to make a fool of him. Brutus grabs the insolent guy again, and Paul gives him an ultimatum. Percy will disappear immediately after Dell's execution. Otherwise, the guards will beat him up and then tell all about his heinous deeds and cowardice under oath. He and Paul shake hands. That evening, Dell is led to the execution. He places the mouse on Edgecombe's shoulder and asks him to take care of it. Since Jingles can't be there during the ceremony, Coffee takes him for the time being. The prisoner is brought out to the audience and is very disappointed to see the smirking Percy. During his last words, Dell apologizes for his sins. He begs Paul not to abandon the mouse. At this point, Percy shamelessly reveals the truth about Mouseville. There's no such place. That's just a fairy tale these guys told you to keep you quiet. Afterwards, Percy is supposed to wet the sponge, but he only pretends to dip it into the bucket. Paul realizes what's happening too late. Percy gives the command to electrocute the prisoner. Dell is writhing in pain, and the room fills with a horrible smell. Meanwhile, John Coffey is also convulsing, trying to share Dell's suffering. Wharton, on the other hand, is hopping with joy. The guy is amused by the chaos. Paul thinks it's best to wait for the man to die and keep the power on. Unfortunately, he's wrong. Dell's agony drags on, and his body becomes engulfed in flames. The audience rushes to the exit in panic. Paul notices Percy averting his eyes and forces him to look at what he's done. When the screams subside, Brutus orders him to put the fire out with the fire extinguisher. Later, Percy has the nerve to say that he didn't know about the sponge. Brutus can't stand it and punches him in the face. Hal arrives and reprimands Paul for this insanity. And that ass Wharton is saying about it. You can hear him up there. Can he carry a tune, Hal? Edgecombe quickly realizes that it's more important for them to get rid of Percy as soon as possible. So he covers for him. That way their pact stays in force. 
Paul then approaches John. The giant is crying bitterly. He had felt Dell's pain, but now it's over. He the lucky one. No matter how it happened, Dell the lucky one. The mouse has run away to solitary confinement again out of fear. John is very tired and goes to bed. Over the weekend, Paul and his wife go to visit Hal and Melinda. The woman is holding up pretty well. Hal says that sometimes she loses herself and shouts out swear words that the man didn't know existed. The next day, Paul invites his co-workers over for lunch and shares the story of his miraculous healing. He suggests they help Hal's wife. To do so, they need to sneak John Coffey out of jail for one night. Everyone is shocked by this idea. If they're caught, they will be sent to jail immediately. On top of that, John is a murderer who could kill them or other innocent victims. This is when Paul reveals that he believes Coffey is innocent. God could not have given such a gift to a murderer and rapist. He eventually manages to convince his friends. On the appointed day, Wharton is given a huge dose of sleeping pills and he falls unconscious. Then all of them happily put Percy in a straitjacket, gag him, and throw him in solitary. Paul says that this is their payback for Dell, and the guy doesn't get suspicious. As the youngest of the officers, Dean stays in the mile. He has small children and can't be caught red-handed. If anything happens, he'll lie that it's coffee in the holding cell, and the rest of the guys are away running errands. John has already realized what's going on and is excited to go for a walk. But as they lead him out of the cell, Wild Bill grabs the man by the arm. John is overcome with terror, and the light bulbs above his head explode. Wharton passes out again. Outside, John is overjoyed at the sight of a starry sky. He picks up some grass and inhales its scent, inviting the others to join him. The four get in the truck and drive to Hal's house. Somehow, the giant knows they want to help some lady. At the place, the warden comes out to them armed with a shotgun. He assumes that it's a riot or an escape attempt. Paul tries to explain everything while John fearlessly steps forward. He can already sense where his help is needed. Hal is shocked, but lets his friends convince him. Coffee sits down near Melinda. She notices that the man has a lot of scars on his body. Someone used to beat him badly, but the man has no memory of his childhood. The giant says his name and moves closer to the woman's face. He touches her lips and the light bulbs light up brighter. All the clocks stop and the house itself shakes as if from an earthquake. John takes in Melinda's sickness and begins to choke. But this time the man doesn't spit anything out. He refuses help while the sick woman regains consciousness. She has no memory of recent events and feels healthy. They get reacquainted with John. She saw a dream that they had met each other in the dark. She gives Coffee a pendant with the image of St. Christopher, who was also a giant who helped others at the cost of his life. The guards drag a tired, sickly John to the truck. Brutus believes that he had kept the tumor on purpose so that he could die before the execution. They make it back safely and put Coffee on his cot. They then release Percy, who has not learned his lesson at all and has only become more embittered. On the way out, John grabs him by the throat and pulls him to the bars. As Percy desperately gasps for air, Coffey lets out a huge amount of gray ashes from his mouth. The guards check on Percy. He's shocked, but seems fine. With blank eyes, the boy paces down the hallway. Suddenly, he turns to Wild Bill and draws his revolver. A tear rolls down Percy's cheek as he puts six bullets into the outlaw and kills him. Percy falls to the floor and ashes spurt out of his mouth. Paul is the first to come to his senses and approaches John. The latter explains that he has punished bad people. When Wild Bill grabbed his hand, the giant saw all of his crimes. Now he is extending his palm to show everything to the boss. They make contact and Paul sees the last day of the dead sisters' lives. His body shakes from pain. The light bulbs around him explode. Wharton was helping the girl's father renovate the house and had dinner with the family. At night, he came for the sisters and took them into the woods. He threatened that if one of them screamed, he would kill the other. The girls remained silent. He killed them with their love. They love each other. John feels pain and suffering all over the world. Bad things happen everywhere and torment him every day. Later, Hal and the police arrive on the scene. Percy doesn't react to others and simply stares at one spot. The warden asks Paul if the events in his house have something to do with Bill's murder. The man realizes that it's best to lie. Percy is then transferred to the mental asylum after all, but only as a patient. Now Paul faces an unsolvable dilemma. John Coffey is a saint, the last man on earth who deserves the electric chair. Edgecombe has done all sorts of things in his life, but if he doesn't prevent the execution, he'll go straight to hell. He shares this with his wife, who suggests he ask John what he wants. Paul follows her advice. 
John's execution is two days away. The kind giant senses Paul's distress and asks him not to worry. He doesn't want to be free. I want it to be over and done with. I do. The man is tired of wandering the world alone, feeling the pain of those around him every day. Dying will be a relief to him. As his last wish, he asks to bring him cornbread again and to watch a movie for the first time in his life. The guards gladly comply with the request. With great delight, John watches the movie Top Hat, the same one that moved Paul in the nursing home so much. John compares the dancing people to angels. Finally, the day of execution arrives. Paul is forced to take the pendant given by Melinda away, but he promises to return it when it's over. Coffee smiles. He dreamed of Mouseville, where Mr. Jingles entertained the sisters, alive and happy. They take him into the hall where John freezes. He senses how much people hate him, especially the girl's parents. They ask to execute the murderer twice to torment him more. Brutus advises him to focus on the guards, who deeply sympathize with John. Dean cries bitterly, tying the kind man to the chair. Paul struggles to keep a straight face. He reads the sentence, and they put a black hood over John. He begs them not to cover his eyes. Don't put me to talk. I was afraid of the dark. Paul complies with the request and wets the sponge profusely. Everyone waits for the boss to give the last order. The latter is unable to utter a word. Instead, he walks over and shakes John's hand. Words flash through his mind, burning a mark on his heart. He kill them what they love. That's how it is every day, all over the world. This is all so unfair and horrible. Paul gives the order. The execution goes smoothly, and John dies without screaming. Tears stream from the men's eyes. Later, Paul puts the pendant on the giant's lifeless body. The old man finishes his story. It was his last execution. Together with Brutus, they transfer to a juvenile detention center to help teenagers get on the right path. Elaine clearly doesn't believe her friend. Among other things, Paul must be much older than he appears. In response, the man takes her for a walk. They arrive at the cabin in the woods. Inside, an old friend of Paul's is living in a cigar box. This isn't exactly the Mouseville we had in mind, is it? We make do. Elaine is shocked to meet Mr. Jingles, who's still pushing his spool like he used to. After John's execution, the mouse came out to Paul again and he kept it. With his magic touch, John transferred some of his power to Paul and the rodent. The man is now 108 years old. He's outlived all of his loved ones and believes it's his punishment for killing a true miracle of God. This is why he'll have to say farewell to Elaine too. Of course, he won't live forever, but he will wish for death long before death finds him. Sometimes the green mile seems so long. Stephen King called this movie the most faithful adaptation of his work. When the author visited the set, he asked to be strapped into the electric chair to experience it for himself. He then very quickly asked to be released. Tom Hanks has agreed to play his role as a favor to the director Frank Darabont. Previously, he turned down the lead role in his movie Shawshank Redemption to star in Forrest Gump. Fifteen mice were used in the movie. Each one was trained for over a month to do different tricks. But Mr. Jingle's main trick was a special effect. The spool was pulled by a fishing line and the rodent followed the scent applied to it. In one scene, Tom Hanks isn't pretending to wipe his jacket. The mouse really did stain it. When Paul introduces Elaine to Mr. Jingles, the mouse was nine times older than the real-life long-living mice, and the mouse that Percy stepped on was a puppet. The actor for the role of John Coffey was recommended by Bruce Willis. They acted together in Armageddon. In the emotional scenes, Michael Clark Duncan recalled his father abandoning their family when he was a child. The actor is actually of normal height and even shorter than some of his movie partners. In one of the scenes, he was put on a box. David Morse stood on the ground, and Tom Hanks was placed in a specially dug hole. Also, a small replica of a prison cot and an electric chair were used to create an illusion on screen. As always, look for the title of the movie in the description of the video. In the meantime, let us know in the comments. What would you do if you were Paul Edgecombe? Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and give this video a like so that more awesome stories come out as often as possible.